joy. joy. Woo, that's a good word. It's not silliness. It's not goofiness. It's the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. Do you know there's none other that says that, that listen, wisdom isn't your strength, although it is, it is good to have, or peace. No, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, I was thinking about where that was said in, in Nehemiah. After they had built all the stuff that got tore up, had favor and had unity, had all these things, major breakthroughs. It was amazing. They, had, they had, had, had it all done. The enemy, no matter how hard he tried, could not get them to stop working on uh, re the rebuilding process. And Ezra, the priest, when it was all getting rebuilt, uh, Ezra was digging through the rubble and found the law. You know why, you know why everything got tore up in the first place? Because they walked away from God. And when you walk away from God, you're headed into bondage. And that's what happened to them. And everything got tore up and they got taken into captivity. Ezra found it in the rubble. He says, oh, I know. What, here's, where, here's where we went wrong. Is we, we stopped obeying all this good stuff. And he starts reading. And the Bible says there in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 4 and 5 in, in that area, 8, in chapter 8. He says, he says, that as he began to read the law to them, they all were filled with understanding. They saw where they went wrong against the law. And they all began to cry. And they all began to cry. See, see that, see that's let me just tell you this. God wants to show you the error of your ways. And when you're when you're walking in a way and it's not pleasing to him, but but God is never going to lead you into condemnation. He'll move you into conviction, but he won't move you into condemnation. And that's why Nehemiah said, Hey, quit crying. We see, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so, so, so it needs to be a happy day when we realize when we're off track, God brings us to the path of repentance and we turn from that and we walk to him. When you walk to him, walk to him with an anticipation that your good God is going to finish that good work he started in you. Somebody give him praise. He's such a good God. God wants us full of joy, not just thinking about it. Not just an expression on your face, but to live it, to do it. Everybody say, do it for the joy. Oh, that's what he wants us, everything we do. If we could, if we could do it from a heart of joy, then life would be so much better for you and everyone around you. Anybody, well, I'm doing this for the Lord. If you can't do it with a good heart, just hang on to it. Just keep it, keep it right there. Don't even, you, you, you're giving God a bad, you're giving bad uh, God a bad rap. Just hang on to it. Um, it's my sacrifice of praise. Ah, really? Sacrifice of praise means in the midst of praise, you got a smile on your face on the outside, which doesn't affect the pain that you got on the inside. That is the sacrifice of praise. It's not a I praise you, Jesus. In the midst of all of these heathens. <laughs> no, that's, that's some scribe and Pharisee nonsense right there. We do. We complicate things. We really do. Paul said in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. If you go back and look through that chapter in context, they were fighting over what they could eat and what they couldn't eat. He said, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, brothers, but it's righteousness. Everybody say righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's what it is? If we could just live in that chapter right there, that verse right there, righteousness. You think you have earned your right standing with God? No, you're the gracious recipient of that. The only way you earn it is by saying, yes, thank you, Jesus. I receive that. Amen. He, he, we are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. He, he did it all for us. We just say, yes, yes, I am a sinner. Forgive me. I repent. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior, and I will live for you. You, you are in charge the rest of my life. I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Amen. And peace. 
If you don't have peace today, it might be one of two things. It could be more, but at least one of these two. It could mean that you might have an ungodly agreement that God wants you to break. Or it may be an agreement that God wants you to have that you keep saying no to. And God's like, no, 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 no. I need you to be obedient and do this. And if you don't, you're going to be, you're going to be slacking on some joy. We need to understand that God, God wants us to walk in that place of a godly agreement, walking away from ungodly agreements, or, and it might be an alignment. Maybe you're exactly where God wants you to be, but you're not in alignment in your heart and in your mind where God wants you to be. Everybody, anybody, don't raise your hand on this one. You ever been in a place where you knew that God wanted you to marry this person and you marry them, but it was out of obligation and not out of celebration? Well, I married you, didn't I? My God, what a horrible mess. I love that I am in not only alignment with God's will, but I'm in alignment with the desires he placed inside of me. I Get to be married to Amy Vosick, Amy Elizabeth Vosick Jennings. It's my joy maker. Oh, if we could just learn how to not only cancel ungodly agreements, agree with godly agreements, but also be in alignment. This is what God wants me to do. This is what I'm going to do. And if I'm out of alignment, mm, my joy will be lacking. And that's what we need. You know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like, um, you ever ro- ride a bicycle with a bent rim? That's not a fun ride, is it? But when you get it all lined up and you get, you get it straight, it's just smooth, it's beautiful, it's easy. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, then why is it so heavy sometimes? Because we're not in alignment with him. Sometimes God wants us to go a little faster than we're going. I, I, I dealt with cattle many years when I was younger. And when you have these cattle, not so much anymore. The yokes were a long time ago, but used to have two of them pulling with each other. And if the, the bigger one pulls more than the, than the stubborn young one, that's usually how it works, isn't it? The young people didn't laugh on that. The young one, and the, and the, the, the older one, it's just like no problem. It's just pulling the other one. And the other one looked like about to get his head pulled off. But then sometimes the younger one, he's, he's feeling himself like, oh, I got this. And he pulls ahead faster than the pace than the, the older, wiser, bigger one does. And he's pulling, 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 trying, trying to hurry up and speed up. And the other one's just going at a slow pace. And the younger one wears itself out. When Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, it's simply this, is we go not at, his, not at our pace, but we go at his pace. So if it, if it seems like it's just like, like you're being pulled along, well, maybe you need to speed up with him a little bit more. Or if it feels like you're, you're, pulling, the, you're pulling this anchor and you can't, may, maybe God wants you to slow down a little bit. We need to check our agreements. And we need to check our alignments. Because if you don't have those figured out, you're going to be lacking joy. And God wants you to be full of his joy, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. Today, I want you to grab this concept. Number one, I want you to really think about as you live your life, as you live as a godly person, as you do the things that God wants you to do, do it. For the joy. Listen, there's joy in in obedience. There is joy. 
And do it for the joy. There is a payoff when you walk in obedience with God. Sometimes it's just you get to be alive. But sometimes, listen, do you know the word says, second to the last thing written and read in the entire Bible, the book of Revelation, he says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Jesus said this, written and read, check it out. Behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. To give, to render to every man according to what he has done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. So break that down. Behold, I'm coming quickly. How many of y'all know Jesus is coming back? Some people don't preach that. He j- Whether you want to agree with me or not, it's not me. The Bible says this, and it's written in red. Check that out. Jesus said it. He says, I, I, behold, I'm coming quickly. So Jesus is coming back. Why don't you just say that with me? Let it just mess with your mind a little bit. Say, Jesus is coming back. Jesus. Oh, good, good. Glad y'all know that. Jesus is coming back. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me. God's got a reward with him for you to give to every man. Does it say everybody gets equal parts? Mm -mm. A a gift rendered, give to every man according to what he has done. I'm the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. I'll never forget when I first gave my heart to Jesus, um, I was in a, after I... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be real nice this morning. So I ended up in a apostolic faith Pentecostal church. This girl, this girl in high school I was seeing, her grandpa was an apostolic faith Pentecostal preacher. And I mean to tell you, I mean to tell you, every Sunday it was hellfire and brimstone. It's like, yeah, listen, like that rat dangled over the fly, fiery flames of hell, and you better get right with God because it could be this very moment that the sky splits open and those that aren't walking in him in holiness could go straight to the flamey fire of hell. I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> this is the way it was. My brother and I, uh, we're, sit- we're sitting in the church, and so, so they, would, they would get going, they'd get the church going, and somebody would say, so give a testimony, and then say, all right, who wants to be in the choir today? Everybody wants to be in the choir? Come on, be in the choir. There were no guests at the church, but me and, me and my brother Billy, Billy was dating the, the, the pastor's daughter, and I was dating the pastor's granddaughter, okay? So, 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 so he, knows, he knows what's up. Pastor, pastor knows what's up. And so me and Ben wants to get us saved. So, so Billy would be laughing if he heard this right now. He's gonna see it later. I can I promise that. But anyway, we're sitting in it. We're sitting in the church, and he says, "All right, who who wants to come be in the choir?" I'm not kidding. Everybody in the church gets up and goes into the choir. There's not 30 people in the church anyway. They're all in the choir, and me and Billy are the only ones standing in the crowd. And we're holding our song book, and we're like, <laughs> "I mean, I see. I can see. I can sing every ZZ Top book, song ever written." But I ain't never sang none of these songs. <laughs> I was kind of looking over there, talking, like that. And then song's over, put it down. Everybody comes, sit down. And when it's time for the altar call, and he's talking about them dirty, rotten sinners that need to give their heart to Jesus, that they're gonna bust hell wide open, and the flames are gonna lit, where the worm is, where the flame is not quenched, and the, and and the worm doesn't get out, and they'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth, and it could be right now. So you better hurry up and get down here and give your heart to Jesus. Listen, if you go to that church in Patterson, Texas, I think the road is 359, I think, or 362, one little you know, between Waller and, and, and Brookshire, there's a little road that winds through there. And there's a historical plaque outside of that church. Nobody goes to that church anymore. I don't know why, but anyway, got a little plaque outside the church. And they keep it all nice and mowed because it's a historical place. And if you go up to the window and you look through the window, and you see that altar? There was not a demon that was, craw- craw- that was clawing at that altar. That was me. I was like, I got, I got to find Jesus. I was like, so please, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. But I'll tell you what I found out later on when my buddy invited me here. I found out that God has not given me a spirit of fear but of love, power, and a sound mind. And in his presence is fullness of joy. And, and I realize this, that, that behold, God is coming quickly, and he knows the day and the hour. 
And we just need to be in right standing with him. And however he wants to do that, if he wants me to, guess what? I'm yay, come on. If he wants me to, and then come back. If he wants me to stay right here and work hard, guess what I'm going to do? Well, pastor, where are you at theologically on that? Tell me. I need to know exactly how it's going to be. I can promise you this. When it comes to end time theology, everybody can fight about it. But nobody's got that thing all figured out. I'm telling you right now. So what I say, what we need to do is we need to walk like we love Jesus. If he wants us to work right here, we're going to work right here. If he wants us to do one of these, we'll do one of those. If he wants us to go there and not have to do work, I'm like, cool, bonus. (laughs) But my thing is, I belong to Jesus. And I'm going to do what he's called me to do here, there, wherever, because wherever he is, that's where I want to be. Anybody else with me on that? Come on now. Come on now. I know some people got it all figured out, but I'm not that smart. But it says, now faith is the things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1. 1. I want you to know, and this is one of the things that will rob you of joy with God, is in the area of faith. You know what faith is? Faith is in what you believe. Everybody say this. Faith is in what you believe. Let me give you the other side of that. Faith is not. Everybody say, faith is not in what you don't believe. This is powerful. Faith should bring us joy. We should not, you know, it's it's this. It's the the premise. I've told my kids this. I tell Amy this when I'm trying to clean my garage, and then she wants to help, and I will tell her, honey, baby, honey, baby, Stay in your lane, girl. I don't tell her how to cook. I don't, she don't tell me how to clean my garage. We need to learn how to stay in our lane. We think we got it all figured out theologically. We do. We think we got it all figured out. Can I tell you, I, I read my Bible, and this is year number eight, right? In this year, year eight, cover to cover, we take a different translation every year. And can I tell you something? Every year when we crack the book from beginning to end, every page, we don't skip anything. We, we eat the broccoli verses, the bagats and the, and the real estate records and, and the law, every bit of it. And every year we get something brand new. God is growing us if we want to grow in him. And not just in knowledge but in our hearts, in maturity, becoming more like Jesus. Stop blasting on somebody else's belief system. Oh, I don't believe that. People say, miracles aren't for today. Mir- you know, mir- all the miracles well, happened in the early church. I mean, there's no miracles today. There's no apostles. There's no prophets. Evangelists. Oh, there's pastors and teachers. But, but you know, really? Really? Why do we have to, why do we have to throw rocks at other people? That's not what God wants us to do. What God wants us to do is read our Bible and then we do it. It's that simple. Pray, have have fellowship with God, pray, and when he tells you to do something, do it with a good attitude. How about this one? crazy cons call me crazy what he wants us to do is love people even our enemies what shot up he wants us to love our enemies bless those that curse us pray for people tell them of the good news of jesus christ that god so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish now john 3 17 let's go ahead and not forget that one for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world would be saved through them through him Oh, why don't, we, why don't we befriend somebody that don't look anything like Jesus, that act like they don't want to have nothing to do with him, and just walk with them for a little bit and talk, talk to them about the good things of God. 
about the kindness of God, about how we once was lost, but now we're found. I once was blind, but now I see. I, I once didn't know what hope was, but now I'm full of hope. Oh, man. It's really that simple. I just want you to know, as, as a, faith should bring joy. Do you know Jesus had faith? Do you know Jesus had faith? So why would Jesus even need faith? Because he's the son of God. He, I mean, he's got all power. He's got all dominion. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. He had all the authority. Then, he, then he's here. So why does Jesus need faith? He just says, and it, and it happens, right? No, Jesus had a faith, not just in what he could do. But he had a faith towards the future in us. What says Jesus, his faith brought him joy. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, mm, oh, this ought to bring you joy. Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Oh, one of the biggest tangle-uppers is religion entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter the finisher of our faith watch this who for the joy set before him endured the cross he did it for the joy despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God I want to go back to that, but I want to finish this. For consider him who has endeared such hostilities by sinners against himself so that we would not grow weary and lose heart. The joy that was set before Jesus. I'm thinking, what joy is that? I, I went back to this many times, many years ago, but recently but in, in where we're at with joy today, I, I, I saw this. For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I thought, hmm. Seated at the right hand of the throne of God, that seems like a place where we could find joy. Yeah. Don't you think? Doesn't it sound like a good place? Good place? Man, that's what an awesome place. Nobody has the VIP seat more than that. Who for the joy set before him despised the cross? The, the cross? That don't sound like a joy place. Do you realize what happens when you go to the cross? You're convicted. You're sentenced to death. There's no joy there. And, and they beat you first with a cat of nine tails, and they ripped the flesh off of your body. And they said Jesus was beaten so bad he was unrecognizable. There's no joy in that. They beat him, made him carry his cross, nailed him to the cross, jammed a crown of thorns on his head, and he was in, it's called the dance of death, where he was trying to get a breath as he's hanging on that tree. And even said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's no joy in that. Endured the cross, despising the shame. Can you imagine the words that were railed at Jesus on that day? Not just by the thieves that were lay, uh, hanging on the cross next to them, but the soldiers were, were calling him names. The people were calling him names. The religious people were screaming, you finally got what you deserved. There's no joy in that. Where was the joy that was set before him? You know where it was? His joy was when he looked across time and he saw you. He saw you. You were the joy that he saw. See, inside of Jesus, there is no such thing as time and there's no such thing as space. I know that does that to you. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, that, that's who Jesus is. He is outside of time and outside of space. And I believe he had the capacity to see each and every one of us, humankind, that who would ever call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. And he looked and he says, my joy is I will gladly do this because that's not my joy. My joy is them. My joy is you. Yeah. And he took it on. He, he took it. Because he loves us. You are his joy. You are his joy. Your neighbor is his joy. Be careful. 
how you treat the one that brings him joy. And when he looked and saw you, guess what he saw? He didn't see you in your mess. He looked past that. He saw you redeemed. Jesus saw you saved. He saw you filled with the Holy Ghost. He saw you walking as an overcomer. That's how he sees you. He saw you as a soul winner. He saw you as a joy maker. It's like they were once messed up. They didn't. They once were not a people, but they now are the people. They are the people of God. A holy, you are not, a, you, you were not, but now you are a, a holy race, a royal people, a holy nation, a people that were not, but now are the people of God. That's his joy. God wants you to be in that place of joy. But I can tell you what will attack God's joy in your life is your agreements and alignments. I need you to know this, that um, there was a statement I made many, many years ago in my faith. Because I've had friends and I had family and I had co-workers that said they're going to live for God and I watched them not. When I landed here, and I knew God spoke to me on that third chair, second row in, you're in my chair, yes, yes, amen. And I said, you know what? He said, this is where I've called you, and this is where you'll stay. And I felt it right here, and I, and I told my pastor. And he said, I wish you hadn't told me that, son. I said, why is that, pastor? He says, usually when somebody tells me they're not leaving, they're gone in about two weeks. And I had that Tex uh, Texas red dirt road cowboy boot voice, and I said, watch me. Whether it was stubbornness, no, it wasn't stubbornness. It was, I was not going to let go of God. And I remember saying it, and I say it all the time in my life right now. I said, I will live for God for the rest of my life, no matter what. I will live for God for the rest of my life, no matter what. Come on, somebody with me. You need to say that. You need to say that because, listen, there's going to be things that are thrown at you. Well, people run to God in foxholes, true. And people, people act like, man, man, uh, so when it gets tough, run to God. Oh, when the storm comes, run to God. But when it's bright and sunny, run to God too. As I tell you, more people will walk away from God when things are going well for them when things are not going well for them. We got we to gotta, we gotta get in that place where no matter if it's amazing, I'm going to live for God for the rest of my life, no matter what. Come on, church. We got to keep it real simple. Just keep it real simple. Find out what you, what, what's that statement. What's that, what's that underscored statement of your life and stay in alignment and agreement with that simple declaration. And I just want you to know this. It will bring you joy. And there will be things that the devil will throw at you to challenge whether or not you meant that. It will. Listen, those unholy alliances that, that tries to pull at you for, pull you away from where God's got you planted and doing what God, what God wants you to do, listen, they will be joy stealers. Because you walk away from the Lord, I can promise you this. The enemy, the first thing he's going to do is going to bring a bunch of condemnation and a bunch of accusation and a bunch of guilt. See, I knew you couldn't live for God. Just a little bit got you rocked and pulled you off. I want you to know this. When you stick to breaking those unholy alliances, listen, you, you can do it. It may cost you, but it doesn't have to steal your joy. When you decide to live for Jesus, I just have to tell you this. I'm not being the bearer of bad news. I'm just telling you how the devil works. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's going to bring you a test. The devil going to bring you a test. Are you real? You really? You're going to live for God for the rest of your life? Come on, man. Really? You're going to live for God for the rest of your life? Are you serious? Listen, I didn't, I didn't pick this one up at Lifeway Bookstore. All I have is my life and I have my story. And please don't get mad at me when I tell you the truth. Because I need to tell you the truth. If I'm not going to tell you the truth and I'm going to preach what God tells me to preach, guess what? He told me this. Either you do, you preach what I tell you to preach and you do what I tell you to do, or you need to go sell vacuum cleaners. Amen. There used to be on the second row right there. On the, I mean, it's back row, second seat. 
you're in the seat of, of this guy. And I'm, I know his name, but I'm not going to say it because he might be watching this and get mad at me. So I said, I, God told me that I'm going to preach what he wants me to preach and do what he wants me to do or go sell vacuum cleaners. He goes, why are you, why are you hating on vacuum cleaner salesmen? I own a vacuum, com- vacuum cleaner company. And that was the one thing that rocked him and pulled him out of the church. I'm like, listen, Lord bless all the vacuum cleaner salesmen in all the world right now. We need them. And there's a lot of good spirit-filled people that love Jesus that win souls that sell vacuums, vacuum cleaners. Anyway, anyway, I was, I was in this place where, where, where like, I'm going to live for God for the rest of my life. The enemy wants to take a shot at me. And uh, so I gave my heart to Jesus. I just, I just came out of a bad situation. I, I left the Catholic Church. There's a lot of good things about the Catholic Church. And there's some, hey, this, uh, anyway, we'll, that, that, that message is for another day. I'm not, I wasn't there. I was angry. I was acting out. I was doing all the things teenagers shouldn't do. And uh, so, so I'm at home. And uh, I gave my heart to Jesus at a revival meeting. I said, you know what? I am. Listen, I am going to live for God for the rest of my life no matter what. And so I got rid of all the stuff I shouldn't be doing. And I'm at home. I'm working, working at my house, getting some stuff done. And here comes my, my buddy Crazy John. We live way out in the backwoods. John got that, um, well, you know, that Braveheart hair, that big red flaming hair out here like this. Look like heat miser off the Christmas show. Hair just all boofed out like that. Uh, you know, a Levi blue jean jacket. John come walking up to my house. Hey, man, what's going on? I heard you church. You going to church and stuff. I go, yeah, man, I'm trying to, trying to figure it out. Just, you know, I know, I know for sure. I'm, I've just got to turn my life around. He goes, hey, listen, I just thought, you know, before you do that church thing, let's just do one more for the road. Just one more for the road. I'm like, no, John, crazy John. His name is Crazy John. No, Crazy John. We're not, we're not going to do, we're not going to do that. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he opened it up, had a big old bag of the best weed you ever had in your life. No, 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 I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not doing this. He goes, he's like, hang on a second, hang on this. You see, this is, this is, this is the deal. This is, this is it. And I go, no, oh, man, we're not doing this. And he lit it up and he, and he took a hit off of it and handed it to me. He said, just one for the road. And man, we smoked that joint. We got so high. We got so high. I'm like, my goodness, where were you six months ago? Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. We got so high. We got so high. And I never, <laughs> I never knew, I never knew what the conviction of the Holy Spirit was. I never knew what the reprimand of the Holy Spirit was because, you know, I had not been living for him. But when the Holy Spirit showed up and said, you know, you had an opportunity to witness to him. You had an opportunity to lead him. But you know what you did? You squandered that opportunity. You know, John could be in hell. He, could be, he, might, he, might, he might go to hell tonight and you missed your opportunity. And I just might hold you accountable for that. He got the Holy Spirit told me a bunch of stuff besides that he said listen either you're gonna live for me or you're not are you gonna live for me for the rest of your life no matter what well that's one of them or, or matter what you got to get rid of you, you you better never do that again i've called you i've blessed you i pulled you in i'm loving her, and then you're gonna do this no no you gotta let that i'm like oh please i mean i've had spankings from my mom and my dad but it but listen when you get spanked by the holy ghost it's like oh i don't ever want i never want that spanking from him Oh, God, give me, give me an opportunity to just help John just one time. A couple of days later, I'm at my house. Here comes John, hair all like that, got his same jacket. I don't think he ever took a bath. Anyway, John just comes, he's walking, what's up, Rich? What's going on? What you doing up here? Guess what I got? This is after a fresh spanking from the Holy Ghost. I said, John, we had this conversation. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we have another conversation. It don't matter. Come on, let's let's get this. Let's get let's get this going. I'm like, John, I told you last time. That was the last time. This ain't no another time. You know what you have to do. You got to go on. You got to get. I don't have. Listen, if you don't quit, you're not gonna be my friend no more. We're not we're not doing this anymore. I am not gonna live like this anymore. He's like, no, really, it's like that. I says, really, and he's like, like he's gonna hand me one. And I'm like. This is, we're talking one of the mobile homes, we're like three feet off the ground because the lot's not level. We're way up in there. John, I'm going I'm to kick you off of this porch and something, you're going to break something. you got to get on and get gone. 
It was like 10 years later, 10 years later, I didn't even talk to John. This is way before cell phones and social media. And Amy said, where did you used to live? I said, out in Lakeside Estates, Hockley, Texas. Red dirt roads out there way, way in the backwoods. Let's go see. We drive down these roads, getting ready to go see some fireworks at another place. and Drive through there and walking down the side of the red dirt road, there was big red hair. The same Levi jacket, just a little more dirty. Going down the side of the road, got a six-pack in each hand. Going down like that. How you doing, John? He just went. Just kept on walking. I'm like, Jesus, did I miss my opportunity? Did I miss my opportunity? But you know what I did? I kept right on driving. I kept right on driving. I don't know where John's at today, but I know where I am at today. Some, sometimes we got to leave some. Sometimes we got to leave some stuff behind. And listen, it doesn't matter. John can't make it. Listen, God can send somebody else. God can make a way where there seems to be no way. But when God says cut it loose, you got to cut it loose. And I not 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 one time ever did I think about that anymore. When you decide to walk in covenant with the church, with the church where God, God has assigned you. And I know there's seasons when, when, when God cross-pollinates and he transplants and moves people. I'm not, I'm not, you know, people, oh, they left river, praise the devil, got them. That's a bunch of nonsense. God does move people. But the enemy does uproot people out of their season and out of their place. And we have to, we have to be careful and we have, to, we have to stay before the Lord and be where he wants us to be. But when you make a decision, I will live for God for the rest of my life no matter what. And I will stay rooted and grounded and planted in the house of God until he tells me otherwise nothing's going to uproot me from where God's called me. And when you make that commitment, I guarantee you something's going to come along and try to test that, test that commitment. I'm telling you what, and it will steal your joy if you don't obey the Lord. There was uh, when we first, many years ago, Greater Life started doing small groups. We used to call them supper club. We used to have a little, we'd go eat at each other's houses and stuff. And I had a business partner. This is 1985 in the middle of the oil crunch. There's a little restaurant on Main Street called, um, it, it was called uh, the Filling Station. It used to be a gas station, but, but it, it was pool tables and pinball machines. We had chili and burgers. Man, best onion rings ever. I was buying it from a, uh, from a buddy that went to our church. And uh, he wanted to have a small group at his house. And so I go, to the, I go to the small group, and I'm sitting over here, and everybody else is sitting around. And, and so I, mean, I got my Bible. I'm all ready to go. Got one of the big, big, thick reference Bibles. I'm like, man, I want to know everything about the Word of God. And I, I sit down. I'm, you know, 19 years old. That's it. Don't know anything about the Word because, you know, in, in the Catholic Church, and I'm not throwing rocks at the Catholic Church. I'm just telling you my experience. We had the biggest Bible in existence to man. It was gold leaf. It was white. Big old honking Bible with beautiful pictures. But it sat on the coffee table. We never, hey, don't you touch that. Don't you, don't you. Get your fingerprints on that Bible. That's a, that's a. And we said our, we said our rosary and, and went to confession. But we never read our Bible. But when I went to this church, Man, he said, you need to get in that Bible. You need to dig it in it. You need to eat it. You need to live it. I mean, you need to, you need to breathe. You need to sleep with your Bible. You need to, the pastor was like, you need to read your Bible. And so I'm at small group, and I'm sitting over here in the big circle like that, and my friend was there and a bunch of his friends and other people that were loosely connected to Greater Life, River, now River of Praise. And I'm sitting there. I'm all excited. Man, my friend's going to tell me something about Jesus. This is going to be so nice. This is going to be so good. Well, they didn't start with me. They started over here. And remember, the Catholic Church, they really fight to guard unity and guard community. It's one of the big things they have going for them. Seriously, you got to give credit where credit is due. They really work hard to, to guard unity in, in the Catholic Church. So there I am with that, with that conviction. And then all of a sudden, they started over on this side, and they said, what you got? And started naming off each one. And first person said, you know what I don't like about Pastor Vossick? He got them big old sideburns. Oh, he's a big old sideburn. Why, why don't he want to trim that up? All right, who's next? Oh, you know what I can't stand? Is they got ladies with microphones on the platform. Can you believe women aren't supposed to speak in church at all, period? 
And the next person go along. Oh, I don't like how he, how he, you know, he just, he looks like down the end of his nose at people. And just every one of them had something stupid to say. I'm sitting there holding my Bible. I'm like, when are we going to dig into the word? When are we going to pray? We're going to pray. We're going to uh, praise the Lord. We're going to read the word, something. And every one of them just chopping up my pastor, just chopping up my pastor, chopping up my pastor. It got around to me. Well, Richard, what you got to say? Well, I don't have much to say other than that. I thought we were gonna we were gonna eat something and we we're gonna have a Bible study. We're gonna pray about something. But all y'all did was y'all bash and trash my church, bash and trash my pastor, my worship leader. I don't I, said, I don't know what any of this is, but the one thing I know is I can't be a part of that nonsense no more. I got my Bible and I walked out at 19 years old. I'm like I had more I had more wisdom than all of them put together. We're not doing this. I got back to the restaurant the next day, and he walked up to me, and he said, man, I don't know what that was that you did last night, but, man, with that kind of attitude, I don't trust you. We can't be part broke the partnership. Oh, one of the greatest things God can ever do for you. I talk about divine appointments, divine timing, divine alignment, but divine disconnects are awesome. Gave me a divine disconnect. And he said, now, we're not going to be able to do this. Try to go get my job back. And man, I almost starved to death. James Yancey, raise your hand on the back row. He's my buddy. We had a friend in our church who hired both of us. And we were clearing woods in, in uh, was that Walnut, you know, Walnut Bend out there in Decker Prairie. And listen, we were back in them woods. And I'm telling you, I don't know why God did that to me. But, but I had a bad attitude with Mr. Klein. Y'all heard part of that story before. He wouldn't hire me back in the middle of the oil crunch. We're out there in the woods. And listen, if it didn't bite you, it would sting you. And if it didn't bite you or sting you, it would make you itch. Poison. I mean, we had poison. I have everything like, Lord, help me. Please, Jesus, get me out of these woods. And Alton said, he said, oh, I'll hire you. You can do some apprentice work for, you know, get a better job as an electrician. You'll be one of my helpers. I go, great. So he had this, this uh, electrical, like a ceiling grid like this. And so I go up in the ceiling grid. It's only about, I don't know, eight feet off the ground. And I go up in the ceiling grid, and somebody had the wires, and he liked to wire it hot so we could go fast. And these wires were up in the ceiling like this on each side of the grid. And he goes, yeah, yeah, it's over there on the left side. You're going to grab that, that, that wire and grab that wire, and you put them in a wire net together and put those together. And then on the other side, about that time, I put my head up in that ceiling, and those live wires was in that grid. I go, I don't quite see it. Bob! Ah! Well, I was like a pinball, pap, 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 and I'm on the ladder, pap, 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 and I come down the ladder, and I go, oh, Lord, Alton, I can't work, I can't do this, I, this is too dangerous for me, gave me a few other odds and ends jobs, and I'm about to, I'm, uh, three car payments behind, and, and running out of gas, I ate all my roommates' food, I said, God, I said, I'm going to live for you for the rest of my life, no matter what, why is this so hard, why is this so bad, it's not because of what God's doing, it's because the devil's trying to take a shot at me, but I want you to know, when you pass your test, God will promote you, amen, he made a way Gave me two or, what was it, three different restaurant jobs. I was waiting tables. I learned how to serve people in a restaurant. And then did some other things. And, you know, I just looked back at that. I thought, man, my God is so good. He wants us to pass our test and always put him first. Just know this. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I need you to stand to your feet. You need, you need to be in this place with me today where you realize that you live in the palm of his hand. You live in the palm of his hand. He knows what you have need of before you even ask. And we need to more and more as we live for him, do it for joy. Not only the joy that was set before him, you being his joy, <laughs> he needs to be your joy. Living for God is an amazing thing. I was thinking about the, the story of when Jesus was walking on the water to Peter and the other disciples when they were in their boat. They see Jesus coming. The storm is raging. And, and they see Jesus. And they say, oh, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. Oh, no, that ghost looks just like Jesus. 
they're crying. We're talking grown men, strong men, pulling these nets all the time. These are, these are strong men. They're, they're, they're God-fearing men. They're connected with Jesus. Jesus didn't pick losers. He picked, he picked people of character. But these grown men are crying in the boat in the midst of the storm. And Peter looks over there, looks at Jesus, sees them crying, looks at Jesus looking like he's having a good day in the middle of a storm. He said, Jesus, can I, can, I come to where, can I come to where you are? Well, come on. Peter got out on that water. <laughs> he was like, what? Are you kidding? I'm not even going to try to figure it out. And he starts getting over to Jesus. But it, there was waves. And as he's walking, there was times that the waves were so high that he couldn't see Jesus. And I believe that's why. All of a sudden, he begins to sink. Help me, Jesus. Jesus might let him get his foot wet. He says, I got you, boy. And then they, he grabs Peter's hand, and then, they, and then they just walk to the shore and left those crybabies out there. No, that's not what the Bible says. Walks back to the boat. You got to realize this. God never wants to let go of you with his righteous right hand. And sometimes the testimony is what saves your friends. Because when he got back to the boat, can you imagine the stories that they were having in that boat? You know, we got to learn how to praise him in the midst of the storm. When the storm is raging the worst, when the enemy is testing your, your commitments, your agreements, your alignments. Listen, it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at you. What matters is, are you going to live for God for the rest of your life? no matter what write that down write it down and when you do God will see it he will honor it and he will rescue he's always on time he may not be as early as you want him to be but he will always be right on time oh come on he did it for the joy and the more you live for him and you stay in, in his agreements and his alignments, the more his joy will fill you in such a way that people will see it and they'll say, guess what, I want that too. Come on, take your hands and turn them like this. Say this with me, Lord Jesus, I need your joy today. If there's alignments or agreements that need to be broken from my life, Show me what they are and give me the courage to let that go. Lord Jesus, if there's alignments or agreements that you want me to make, embrace and keep. Give me the courage to do so. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior for the rest of my life. And I will have your joy in Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, give him praise, church. Thanks again for watching River of Praise. We hope that we inspired you, encouraged you. And if we did, would you please share this video with your friends and family? Also, if you'd like to support River of Praise, there's a link on the bottom of the screen you can click to give. Thanks again for watching.